Uh, you know, you okay. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today to learn a little bit more about the current Main Library Gallery exhibit, which is Out and About, Queer Life in Iowa City. Um, since we have kind of a smaller group today, please interrupt us anytime if you have questions or anything like that. Um, we'll just keep it a little bit casual, um, but I will do an introduction here. So I um, just want to note that it's always exciting to see the final product when we work for so long on an exhibit production project. So we hope that if you haven't already had a chance to visit that you'll pop down to the gallery before the exhibit closes, which is on June 30th of this year. Um, speakers today are Maddie Hoberg and yours truly, Sarah Pinkham. <laughs> Um, I'll make some introductions for those who don't know us very well. I think there's maybe a couple of people in here who are not super familiar with Maddie and myself, um, and then we'll get into our presentation. So uh, Maddie Hoberg, whose pronouns are she, they, is the library's annex assistant at the UI Library's offsite storage facility. She's worked at the facility since its opening in 2016. In addition to this work, she's been involved with the LGBTQ Iowa Archives and Library, which is a nonprofit community lending library and archives here in Iowa City. Maddie recently completed a run as their interim executive director and archives coordinator. Woohoo, Maddie. Uh, she received her MLIS from University of Wisconsin-Madison High School in December 2021 and participates in several committees at, at the libraries and on campus relating to diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. And Maddie is the lead curator for this exhibit and the person who sent us the proposal back in 2020. And I'm Sarah Pinkham, and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the exhibition and engagement coordinator at the Main Library Gallery, and I've been with the library since 2019. And while I'm not a librarian, I'm, I'm a cultural heritage and museum professional with over a decade of experience in nonprofit operations, public programming, exhibit production, communications, and in wearing a variety of hats simultaneously. So it's been my privilege to work here at the libraries with a talented staff of experts, particularly the team that makes each exhibit happen. Um, they are all awesome. So I look forward to many more years of sharing library exhibits and programming with our campus and community. So why did we decide to create this exhibit? I will let Maddie explain a little bit more here about her vision. All right. Can you, do you want to, I don't know if we want to go forward slides. I, I forgot this is, this is Maddie and this is me. Okay, moving on. Uh, <laughs> um, so we were interested initially when I put in the proposal it was before COVID. So that kind of like definitely jam, jumbled some stuff up. Um, but the main goals were to really, one, try to highlight like the stories and histories in the Iowa City area from both the university and the city. So because we have a lot of friends, like especially in the lesbian community in Iowa City, that not necessarily a whole ton of them work for the university. And there's definitely like a sort of split, right, between queer life within UI and queer life within, within Iowa City. And so we wanted to try to highlight both of those and show those both as like valid experiences. Um, and that people show up in different ways in those different spaces, um, that there is overlap in, in activism and things like that. And that there's excitement and joy and happiness in all of that. Um, a big part of it too, and especially now with some of the laws that are going forward, it was really important to like, humanize the experiences of queer people and trans people in particular for me, um, which trans and non-binary folks are so often overlooked or erased or, you know, written off for a variety of reasons that I don't necessarily understand. Um, and so we wanted to try to like showcase those stories and the long lasting, like how long the people have been here, right? Like we've always been here, we will always be here, right? That kind of thought. Um, so we wanted to help with that kind of human aspect. Um, we also wanted to contextualize the history of queer rights and um, LGBTQ rights within a bigger context. So the kind of thought was looking at national kind of trends or events and how they manifested in Iowa City. So, or in Iowa. So we have like, for example, on the Mila laws, especially, it'll have like notorious sort of historical moments um, or events like Pride and talking about Stonewall and things like that. And then it'll talk about how at the um, 
oh my gosh, the homecoming parade, Gay Liberation Front had a float, right? Which was right, right after Pride. It was a response to the Stonewall riots, right? Um, so that kind of shows that even though we're like not necessarily the biggest town, even though we're not like this intense uh, urban center necessarily in the same way, like I was seen as a much more rural space or a flyover state, we still are and have been responding to national events and issues all along, right? We've always been here doing that. Um, also wanted to make a visible space that showcased and highlighted queer life as it shows up in our archival holdings. So we used University of Iowa archives, um, Iowa women's archives, and then also um, Lyle, so LGBTQ Iowa archives and library, which is very, very long. So we call it Lyle for short, a little easier. Um, and then also in doing that, realizing how many gaps there are in our holdings and the intent Hi. of uh, trans and non-binary people uh, represented within our collections, as well as the lack of um, perspectives from people of color. So like the BIPOC community, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, so we wanted to use what we had while noting, using it as an opportunity to talk about why we need to grow and, and be doing better for other Um, so who is involved? Here's a lovely picture of Bill Voss and Giselle Simone <laughs> um, putting putting a case lid back onto a case. I um, just want to acknowledge that there are a lot of people that make exhibits happen in the gallery and um, just kind of name a few of them. So Maddie Hoberg and Aiden Bettin were our curators for this exhibit. Um, I'm the coordinator for exhibits in the gallery. Bill Voss is our preparator, um, and that means that he puts together all of the mounts for all of the items that are on display um, sometimes has to get very creative <laughs> with things, um, but he always does such a great job. Kelmia Strong is our designer and she had a lot of fun with this exhibit, um, kind of going off of some of the, the visual themes that Aiden and Maddie had mentioned at the beginning. And you'll see a little bit of that a little bit later. Um, Giselle is our conservator, and so during our meetings, uh, when we're deciding what goes into the exhibits, Giselle will assess all of the items and see if they need any treatment work through conservation. Um, Anna Holland, this time around, was such a great help with editing for this exhibit, particularly because we had um, so many items from IWA, and it was really great to have her input um, and help us uh, make sure that we had all the facts straight for that. Uh, Ken Klinkenbeard is uh, the one who makes sure that our exhibit page for the website looks good. <laughs> so if you ever get a chance uh, to go to the page for this exhibit or any past exhibit, um, you'll see some fun curator highlights and he makes sure that that those all show up properly. And, um, and just a shout out to you also to the many friends and colleagues from across the libraries, the university and the Iowa City area that also made this uh, specific exhibit possible. So how are items selected oh, for I, display? Okay, sorry. I'm trying to pull up. Where did the chat go? I was trying to put the link for the website real fast. I wasn't fast enough. Okay, there it is. Um, so when it came to choosing items that were going to go on display, we wanted to, like I said earlier, we wanted to cover both University of Iowa and Iowa City queer life. And so obviously University of Iowa Archives has a lot more of UI orgs, right? So we were able to pull like a lot of stuff from um, the LGBTQ staff council, right? Things like that, or queer queer council. I can't remember what it's called now. Um, and information and related um, documents about student organizations in particular and some staff organizations. Um, Iowa City Queer Life, we were able to get a lot from both Lyle and people, I mean, people in the community helped by providing some stuff, especially the IC Kings. And then um, I, uh, I Women's Archives. So I Women's Archives had a lot more outside of just the university, especially with Lesbian Alliance. Um, so we wanted to utilize those collections as best as we could to show a wealth of different ways that 
community is organized within those different spheres and uh, between those spheres. Um, we also wanted to include individual profiles and highlights as part of that like humanizing aspect. Um, so we have like profiles of like the IC Kings, we have um, uh, Rusty, um, Rusty Barcelo has a whole section, Stephen Allen Carlson, who's a newer collection, right? Um, and that was part of what we wanted to do was see like, what do we have? What's newer that people may not have encountered? So Stephen Allen Carlson was one of those that for me, it's, it's stored out here. So I had like experiences of putting that away, putting away those collections and kind of seeing what was in there. Um, and it was so cool. Like it was such a, a cool experience. And I was like, this needs to be highlighted. People need to know we have this, right? So um, that was really, that was a big motivation to put forth newer stuff, really robust and in-depth collections that we have. We also wanted to display um, diverse perspectives whenever possible. So the our, the exhibit itself is very like lesbian heavy because we got a bunch of stuff from Iowa Women's Archives. Um, but there was obviously, there's also like from IWA, we got a lot of information from, um, oh my gosh, Pat, Trisha, I can't remember the name. I'll have to look it up. But um, we got a lot of materials about AIDS um, organizing and care during the AIDS epidemic. So, you know, those kinds of things of different perspectives as far as like gender and sexuality identity, um, different ways that people gathered, tried to find as much racial diversity. Our collections are very white in general. That tends to be a problem across archives in on mass, I guess, right? Like that just is a thing. Um, but wherever we could try to have better representation of people of color and people with different gender identities and um, sexual preferences and things like that, we did. Um, and then we would look at the materials, pull them, there were like little slips, green slips, stick them in the box, right? And then um, marked an A on what we were using to make sure that we could keep track of everything. And then when we have to put it back, knowing where it goes basically at the end of the exhibit. This photo here on this slide is a behind the scenes peek at a layout meeting. <laughs> so what we tend to do is um, pull the items out and put them on a case footprint. And as you'll see, that was case number 10, which is more of an internal labeling thing. Um, and then just to make sure that everything fits in the case. So this is um, this is a behind the scenes shot of testing out layout for our Lesbian Alliance case um, that's on display in the gallery now. Okay, so, and we sort of, Basically, the way that we lumped it together was trying to, um, like I said, bridge that sort of gap between not just university, but also Iowa City. So I'm doing this motion because I'm thinking of how you can get on the room. So when you walk in, you're supposed, you start on the right side of the room if you're looking into it. Um, and that's basically the University of Iowa orgs. So we have a lot of student orgs within the big long case that's on the wall. And then we move along to more of the centers or community resources that are open to not just students, but also um, staff, faculty, um, alum, community members, et cetera. Pride Alliance is pretty open to whoever needs to use it, right? And the LGBTQ clinic is another one that's included in there. Um, and then we moved on to some community organizations and that included both businesses and just groups. Um, that organized. So we have like Ruby's Pearl, uh, Grace and Ruby's, things like that. And then we have publications, like queer publications. So we have like a wealth of those in iWomen's archives and in the UI archive special collections and, and at Lyle. So we wanted to try to highlight that because that has typically been such a like kind of grassroots way for queer people to find each other and to communicate and share news, especially like access line was used really heavily during the AIDS epidemic to share news about uh, rates within Iowa and talking about um, how to best care for people and, and practice safe sex and things like that, um, especially for people who are in more rural areas and might not have the same kind of access to um, community organizations like that. And then on in the floor cases, we have more of the community organizations um, 
from softball leagues to lesbian alliance to the AIDS coalition of Johnson County, things like that. And then on the walls, we tried to highlight, like basically with posters, try to do the individual highlights um, for people like that have cool collections or are doing cool stuff, basically. And then also historical uh, moments for that national to Iowa City. And this is yet another behind the scenes thing. Um, this is a map that we tend to use of the gallery just to remind ourselves what we're talking about in which case. So uh, obviously there's some like old stuff on here like TBD, <laughs> which walls, where are we putting certain stuff? But kind of gives you an idea of how we try to keep things organized visually um, in one way. And so we, a big thing like I mentioned earlier is like who's, not represented, who's not in the space, right? So there was very, from the beginning, and part of my impetus for like putting in the proposal for the gallery, um, so many, I mean, it was pre-COVID, so it was like forever ago, right? Was was like doing some digging in the archives um, and in like old Hawkeye yearbooks and old Daily Islands and stuff. And it's just, I mean, it's very white, gay or lesbian folk right and it's it's very much white and cis and so that was something that I wanted to push back on and try to invite people to talk about that try to recognize where that's coming from um as an opportunity for like library staff right and library workers to think about why those groups might not either feel like they're stories are valued enough to be stored, right? Or why they might not trust like an, an academic institutional repository like the university or even a community repository like Lyle to house their materials and, and how we can try to correct that either by supporting other efforts from those groups themselves, like queer people of color and things like that, or um, how we can, you know, show them what's available, right? Um, which basically like not in a like white savior way but like here's the tools that we have if you want them, right like just how what do we need to do be doing better to communicate what do we need to be doing better so that people feel safe and welcome and included in value and so uh BIPOC which is black indigenous and people of color were notably underrepresented in the um collections and in the exhibit as well as um, identities within the queer community itself that often get maligned or marginalized. And that was trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming folks, for sure. Um, bi and pan erasure, which is something that's really hard, especially in a more visual format to like address. Um, but that is something that was very, very difficult. Um, and that's a, a common thing within the queer community itself. Um, Geez, skipping ahead, Sarah. Sorry, my hand fell. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, okay. that was a preview, you guys. Oh. <laughs> and so, and then polyamorous relationships, which has definitely become more of a common topic within queer communities and in, in Iowa City too. And then as well as people who are ace or people who are asexual or may be aromantic. Um, and luckily we did include an interactive component. And I have seen a lot of people posting about um, asexuality and aromanticism and, and wanting more education around that. So it was really cool to be able to include an interactive component where people can be like, I don't, see, basically like, I don't see me here, right? And that's valid. Like, that's true. There are some people that it's just, we don't have the materials for, but we want those voices and we need those voices. They're so valuable. So it's been really cool for me to see those showing up and making the in their presence and noting the absence right is bringing up very valid critiques about our collections and the exhibit and is improving the exhibit by being so um that was that's been really cool but still a lot of work to do to try to make those those folks more central with that interactive too in the exhibit, so all of the stories that we're collecting, whether it's handwritten stories on cards in the exhibit or collected uh, online, which we've got a, a survey for that online uh, on the exhibit website. So there should be a button that says, tell your story or something like that. 
Uh, so if you're interested in sharing your story about queer life in Iowa City, we would so welcome that because um, those stories with your permission and with the permission of people who have already submitted stories will be going into the university archives. So that's, um, that's another way that we are trying to improve some of our holdings um, to be a little bit more representative as well. So please, if you have a story, um, share it. You are not obligated to uh, say your name if you're if you're not interested and you'd rather be anonymous, but you're definitely welcome to do that in the exhibit or um, through the survey that Maddie just threw into the chat. And those will be printed out and added to the interactive board as well. So, okay, because I got ahead of myself before. <laughs> with my hand falling on the keyboard. Um, so this, number one, this is an excellent artifact. Just acknowledge the majesty <laughs> of this flyer. Um, but I wanted to talk just very briefly about conservation and exhibit preparation. So the reason that I've, um, that I've put this image here on this slide is because if you see in the far right bottom corner, <laughs> there's just a little tear uh, which has had a repair in it. And so that's this is one of the things that um, Bill did some treatment on in conservation. So just had a little tear and he was able to repair that. And so that now when it goes back into the Iowa Women's Archives, it will be repaired. And I think that's one of the, the nice things about being able to pull out items for display for the gallery is that you're able to find things that might need a little bit of attention, a little conservation treatment, and be able to treat those items and put them back into the collection. So I think that's one of the, the nice things uh, about having individual items out. But so there weren't a lot of items that needed conservation treatment for this exhibit, but this is one example. And you can also kind of see uh, at the very bottom, there's a shiny line bit <laughs> that's uh, part of uh, one of Bill's mounts for this. So if you get a chance um, to go through the exhibit, just check out uh, the fun ways that Bill has put these things on display. But I also wanted to say thank you to Zoe Webb also for her assistance. Um, Zoe was able to help us prepare the gallery um, for installation of the current exhibit. So thanks to Zoe. Um, so exhibit installation and design, Installation is always a bit messy, and I wanted to show that <laughs> with with this slide here. So um, typically, the installation takes a couple of weeks. We usually allow a couple of weeks. So that gives us time to uh, pull out things from the previous exhibit, gather all of the items that we had on display, and um, properly return them, and then also to tear things down <laughs> um, and start putting other things up. So. Um, also, the, the gallery between exhibits usually needs to be patched on the walls. Usually, we kind of like rip paint and stuff off the wall somehow. It's just kind of inevitable. Um, so we end up having some wall repair to do and some painting between. So that's not shown here. But I do have uh, in the images the Grace and Ruby's Women's Restaurant. That is uh, a photo of items on on display without yet their, the hood. So the case lid is not on. Um, so we make sure that we get things just right and everything is dusted and then put the case lid on. Um, next to that is the creating queer spaces section right above the IC Kings case. And um, we had decided at some point in the last, I don't know, the weeks leading up to the exhibit that we wanted to add some more large labels and kind of um, section things off a little bit more visually, obviously. So Calmia printed some uh, some vinyl and we we're able to stick that onto the wall above the different sections. Um, so the back of the cases uh, have are, are printed on Sintra board and the wall panel printing is on Gator board. Um, and it's really nice that UI printing service is able to do this now because we used to have to have someone in Marion do this, um, but now we have it on site. So that's been really great. They've been great to work with. Um, and we kind of talked about the mailbox for a visitor story submission. So I won't get too much into that, but I just wanted to show. So the picture at the bottom there is just me at like 7 p.m. one night <laughs> putting stuff, um, putting stuff together for that interactive section. Um, and so as you can see, we use a lot of tape. There's foam double-sided tape. So that's the secret to the ex exhibitions is a lot of foam tape. <laughs> um, 
And as you can kind of see, the curators had requested a lavender theme. So Calmia really took that and ran with it. And so the color theme for the exhibit is shades of lavender. And she also chose kind of a fun 70s-esque font, which you can see um, in these photos as well. And if you have any more questions about design or kind of um, behind the scenes installation things, definitely ask towards the end of the presentation as well. I just, I'm sorry. <laughs> I always take, take a silly picture when I'm cleaning under these because it is so awkward. <laughs> I have to worm my way under a case lid and clean the inside and I don't always do the best job, but I do my best. <laughs> I try. So here's me, some weirdo cleaning glass on the inside of a case lid. Moving on to some of Maddie's favorites. Yeah, so like I mentioned, uh, the Stephen Allen, also I can't, I'm just gonna say this first of all, can't imagine having to slide into one of those cases. But it looked like you definitely had like the oil can for the Tin Man a little bit in your hand with the, I don't know if it was like cleaning fluid, but. Oh, that's a good point. Yes, that is cleaning fluid, courtesy of okay. conservation. And it is a 50-50 water and ethanol solution. Oh, that seems so intense. And to be trapped in that small area with the fumes. It's kind of like a nightmare scenario. It's almost like I take a picture to prove that I was there just in case something happens to me. <laughs> if I die, you know why. Okay. All right. Away from death conversations. So Stephen Allen Carlson was a new reflection that we got. He's a gay man who's born in Iowa and lived in Iowa his whole life. Um, he, I think he was born in... He was born in... Okay. Yeah, there we go. So he was Tabor. in Iowa City, but he moved to Iowa City, was in Iowa City for a long time. So I actually like randomly got to meet him. Um, and it must have been 2016 because it was we were doing the open house for the annex and having people over. And he would he did catering at Hy-Vee for a long time. So he came in and dropped stuff off. And of course, I was like so nervous. And he was like, what's this building? So I'm like, I can give you like a mock tour to try to like get my jitters out, right? And so took him back and, and showed him around and kind of ran through what the, the general tour was. And he had mentioned at that point, like, oh, I have, um, I have diaries from like the 70s until um, present day. Uh, about like being a gay man in Iowa City and he's like I think about burning them sometimes and I was like don't you dare Stephen right I was like do not do that because it's like so valuable and you, there's not often that you get like a single person's perspective over that kind of a span of time and that can have a lot of value to it and so I felt really grateful to get to meet him and then he did pass away in 2021 2020 I think it was 2020 yeah, I think yeah. so too. So I, he did pass away. And when he passed away, he had noted that his materials could be archived. And so that's how they came. And I was like putting them away at the annex. And like, of course, I, I heard from him that he, I was sad to hear about his passing, but very glad that we were going to be able to get his diaries. Right. But I also didn't know that he had these cool, he took a lot of pictures. Right. So we have a lot of his photography and I had this experience of like, being on the lift, which I don't, you know, the annex, the shelves are 22 feet tall. So we have to use a lift to um, shelf things higher up. And so I was like taking these like sheets of Kodak slides and just like holding them up to the light and looking at them. And it was so cool. This like contrast of like, here's like a really intimate portrait. And then here's like somebody's dog and then some artsy fartsy pictures of peas on a table. Like it was so cool to see just like what his perspective was on what was beautiful and that it was so varied. So I, I really thought it was, it was really moving. It was really cool to see. And it was definitely something that was one of my favorite things to be able to highlight. And these are all photos from those slides and these were digitized for us by Bethany Davis. So many thanks to Bethany. Um, and one of our favorite things jointly in this exhibit is Ken Bunch, this delightful man in the Iowa shirt. <laughs> and I don't know, Maddie, if you want to explain kind of our journey with Ken Bunch. Yeah. So Ken Bunch, we, I, at the, at Lyle, we have a collection from Tracy Yorgum, who's this man who in the 70s filed for marriage with Ken Bunch, right, in Iowa City. 
Um, and they weren't dating. They weren't in a romantic relationship. They were just friends, but they're like, hey, somebody else in like Minneapolis just tried this. Let's go try it and see if we can get this license, this marriage license. And it didn't work, of course, but it was kind of like my introduction. And of course, we have more of Tracy's materials and perspective um, from our holdings in Lyle, but I knew the name Ken Bunch, right? And when we were looking through the Stephen Allen Carlson stuff, I was like, who's this like cute little twink in the Iowa shirt, right? Like, I was like, who is this? Like, this is such a cute picture. It's a great like crossover between community and university, right? Like, it's really cool. We should show this in the exhibit. And then we found out, um, I can't remember who told you, Sarah, but somebody was like, that's Ken Bunch. And yeah. We were- um, Michael Blake, who is a yeah. friend of David McCartney, who was a friend of Stephen Allen Carlson. <laughs> Yeah. everyone is friends <laughs> yeah so it was so cool like it was just amazing to see like the friendships and the community that exists within Iowa City and how you know how much people knew each other and were friends with each other it was just really cool to be like oh my god I can't believe that like this person this kind of like unnamed figure that was just like this cute little picture was like oh holy shit this is a guy who like pushed for marriage equality way before anybody else was doing it so it was I don't know. That was really fun to find out. And then as far as like other things that were included, I really appreciated, we did a lot of, uh, both Sarah and I did a lot of community outreach as far as like trying to get in conversation with people for like the individual highlights and some of the group highlights in, and to fill gaps, right, within the exhibit of things that weren't necessarily owned within official archival repositories. So those are like, I call them community borrowed items. Um, So the, all the IC Kings, all the IC Kings materials and the statements that we got from the different performers, those were all sourced from the community for this exhibit. Um, And it was really cool because it's like, we have the IC King shirt. They're like, this is the first t-shirt we ever made for like merch. And I think that Sarah Tate, who the bless, like, gave us like a bunch of materials was like I don't know that any others exist right so it was really cool to see like this this old merch from like because it's been around for over a decade and it was just amazing to see this long-standing ice uh drag kings troop and their sort of history that they have um and being able to hear the statements from people that like I know (laughs) both as the, as their king's personas, but also like personally to be able to have them verbalize and, and indicate what being a part of the group means for them and the kind of gender euphoria that that creates for some of them and things like that. And the sort of like visibility that that provides um, and creativity outlet, um, I think was really moving. Like it was really cool to see, like this isn't just you know, it, it has, it's deeper than just, uh, this is a fun thing I do Thursdays once a month. You know what I mean? Like it was, it's like, this has helped me kind of figure out who I am and where my key is. So I really, I really like that. We've included just one quote on the bottom. We received many from the Kings, which were like really touching, like Maddie was saying, but the quote from Frankie D. Lover, just part of the quote that we received from Frankie is the most powerful and humbling thing is seeing how our performances and sheer existence have positively impacted the lives of queer youth. That is one of the many reasons why I love this group and being a King. So that's really nice. Especially, Especially again with like the, the legislation is like looming so large right now. Um, you know, it's, it really is like, it's very scary. You know, it's a very scary thing for these people who this is like a real outlet for. Um, and it is really moving and impactful for younger people to see a lot of the people that are, or were on the IC Kings are now parents, right? They all have kids of their own and it's scary for them to like, not be able to be as visible right like because it is and I've known like trans young people that are like I saw so-and-so perform and it was just mind-blowing to me about what gender can be and what gender can look like right and it's like little kids you know so I think if you can do anything to push back against some of it in your own way like I would encourage you to do so it is something that's very scary for people who gender bend 
either as part of a performance or people who um, are trans or non-binary or gender fluid, this is a very kind of scary time. So I would do what you can, <laughs> that's what I'll say. Okay, and then on a less bummer note, um, these are other community borrow items um, that we received. So we did a case on the um, Greek or the queer Greek organizations on campus um, and we got a paddle from Quinn who actually works at the law library. Um, and they had a gamma rho lambda paddle that they let us use within the exhibit. And that was really cool. We had, we had some paper documents about um, the, the gay frat basically, uh, the gay queer trans frat. And then we had, we got pictures from Lam Lambda, oh my God, Gamma Rho Lambda, uh, which is like the lesbian queer trans frat or sorority. Um, so we got some pictures from them, but we knew we wanted to include a paddle if we could. And so Quinn was uh, gracious enough to loan that. So that was really cool to see. Um, and from a newer, you know, class of a, rel a somewhat newer class of um, of sorority members, um, and then the other object that's included here is the um, the for the rainbow graduation case. We thought it would be cool to have the cords included, and so Danielle Martinez, who works in like student retention, she's real cool. Um, she donated both the uh, rainbow and a trans cord. Um, that they used at um, one of the most recent Rainbow graduations. So that was really cool to get to include those things. So I'm including here a few of my favorite things as well. Um, this is a flyer that I found in IWA while I was doing some scanning, and this is magnificent. <laughs> um, and it kind of hails back to the time where handmade promotion was such an important way of getting the word out about things and organizing in that way. And um, Maddie had mentioned earlier the Gay Liberation Front at Iowa and um, how that was a response to Stonewall in 69. And um, Gay Liberation Front at Iowa was established in 1970. And we're the oldest um, Gay Liberation Front in the Midwest. So that's really a point of pride, I think, for Iowa. Um, so I wanted to just note that really quick. And then, so this this is a flyer for a weekend that is kind of serving as a fundraiser for the Midwest Gay Pride Conference. And we learned that the Midwest Gay Pride Conference happened between 1974 and 1976. So it was kind of a short-lived conference, but it was really important and really popular and had a lot of special celebrity guests and really frank conversations about things that many queer people had not ever had the opportunity to have conversations about in public with others. So it was a really liberating time um, and a really important conference. So what this Outrageous Weekend Flyer does is um, kind of show, we've got Divine there, um, legendary drag queen uh, affiliated with John Waters. And this is from Pink Flamingos in 1972. Um, like, that's that's a movie <laughs> if you haven't seen it. <laughs> um, and then we also have Blue Reed. So they're kind of uh, doing sketches of, of things that are happening that weekend. So we had Pink Flamingos screening on campus. There was a benefit dance for the 1975 conference, um, a planning session for the conference. They had potluck um, promoting a Lou Reed concert and really hoping that you have a divine time. And I have a divine time looking at this flyer. So we put it in the exhibit. Um, I have no notes about this. This is probably my favorite thing in the exhibit. <laughs> This is from uh, from the Lesbian Alliance, from the Carla Miller and Jean Bott papers from Iowa Women's Archives. Um, there wasn't a date on this series of photos. It just said 1970s, 1980s. Um, and so uh, I think this speaks for itself. <laughs> I feel that we 
all need these aprons and that's how I feel about it. Um, so 19, 1973 is when Lesbian Alliance was uh, founded and it was active until at least 1992. And what we had said in the exhibit is that it was integral in creating opportunities for lesbian women to gather, advocate, dance, build community, write and publish about their lives. And um, one thing that I noticed while we were researching for this exhibit is that um, there was the the women's restaurant Grace and Ruby's is in the current day Bricks. So if you're ever at Bricks on Lynn, just imagine it as a hub of lesbian community back in the 70s. So anyway, um, and then also just a quick note, you can see the strap on the top of the photo. I took this picture in the mount that bill made so it is well protected <laughs> in the case um but yes this is the best photo everything about it is great uh another thing that i really like and also that rusty really likes is this personal letterhead so when i contacted rusty about her panel in the exhibit um we let her know what was going to be in the exhibit from her personal papers um and i I let her know about that and she was so thrilled to see her Dyke Dean letterhead again. She had the best time <laughs> remembering that and then some of the really positive letters that she also received because in 1991 she came out publicly on the Iowa campus as a welcome for um, gay pride rally that was happening that year. And um, so there's a photo of her in this clipping um, giving the welcome. And that's when she came out. And, you know, we do have a lot of negative letters also in her papers about this. Um, but we really wanted to focus in this exhibit, I think, on uh, the positives too. And so there are a couple of letters on Rusty Barslow's panel that are from members of the community saying, thank you. Thank you for coming out. And thank you for saying what you've said. Um, so if you get a chance, please pop in and read those. Um, but what Rusty had said to me is, this would be my first time making a public statement about my total identity as a Chicana lesbian. I wondered how communities of color would respond because of my work with them throughout the Midwest. And after the welcome, students sought my counsel about their own struggles with their identities. So that was a really important time for Rusty as well, being able to connect with the students, um, in addition to her work with the Latino Native American Cultural Center, which she founded in 1970. There's a lot of stuff going on in the 70s in Iowa. So... Uh, these are a couple of my favorite things as well, and I think particularly for me, the Dyke Dean letterhead is, I mean, it's great anyway, but then just hearing Rusty absolutely, like, cackling over this, like, remembering <laughs> how much she loved that letterhead um, really made it for me as well. Um, and we wanted to throw in, so we've we've certainly had some class visits happening so far over the course of the semester, and I've been speaking with students about their impressions of the exhibit and about some of their favorite things um, in the exhibit. And these are a few things that I remember students speaking with me about. And um, number one, I just want to say that the reaction from students to this exhibit has been overwhelmingly positive. It feels to them like a safe space, a place that they're invited to enter and are welcome to enter. And I think of of all the, that gives me all the warm fuzzy feelies <laughs> because that's what I want out of that space in the gallery. And I know Maddie feels the same way. And so in addition to just having some really nice conversations about the exhibit in general and it feeling welcoming and helping students who are queer to feel seen, um, these are some things that the students have really connected with. So we have a couple examples from Better Homes and Dykes. There's the like Hamburg Inn number two with the two women in their overalls surrounded by corn, which is excellent, <laughs> um, like very Iowa City slash Iowa, and then uh, Better Homes and Dykes in the far right hand corner. Uh, December, January 1975. So those are just some examples from Better Homes and Dykes, but um, those are things that students have really been enjoying looking at in IWA, in addition to Common Lives, Lesbian Lives. I think the publications in general have been really interesting to the students, and they really appreciate having these samples on display in the gallery, and it inspires them to go check things out in, in IWA. So that's been really nice. Um, and then they're, if they're in a class who has been to IWA, they're able to make a connection between what they have looked at um, just simply out of the boxes in the archives and some some context behind those things in in an exhibit so that's been a fun connection for them to make as well um, 
there's a photo of uh, from the Iowa Women's Press, and they're really interested in the fact that there was this prominent lesbian press in Iowa City, and that people were coming here to um, publish through the Iowa Women's Press, and that Iowa City was known for that um, the 70s and 80s, and so um, students have really been connecting with that and just finding it fascinating that Iowa City was such a center for these things. Um, the I did notice that somebody had said that they had never heard of the AIDS quilt before. So what Maddie was mentioning earlier about some of the national context in the exhibit, uh, in the center of the exhibit, we have a series of large walls that have posters on them. And one of the posters is about the AIDS memorial quilt. And so there was a student who I spoke with who had never heard of the AIDS memorial quilt and who really didn't know a lot about AIDS. So we have uh, a lot of... Um, opportunities for students to learn a little bit about AIDS, HIV in the exhibit and um, be able to do a little bit more research for themselves. Um, and that's something that they didn't grow up hearing much about. So that's been a good opportunity for them. Um, the Lesbian Alliance case has been a hit for sure. Uh, there's a survey in there. Again, if you get a chance to go down there and take a look, there's a survey that is <laughs> amazing. <laughs> because it's extremely blunt. <laughs> I'll just say the students have been connecting with it um, and I highly recommend taking a look. Um, so, so that is a Lesbian Alliance case. And then the Ruby's Pearl materials are also really interesting to students. They just like the fact that we're really open um, in this section about sexuality and the history of this shop and, um, and it fits in really well with the exhibit. So those are kind of some things that students have been connecting with so far and we've still got much of the semester left. So I look forward to seeing what else the students talk about. Is there anything that you would add, Maddie? Um, I was, I would just add that I initially, you know, I, when we were doing, especially when we were doing the, the meal walls, so like the posters about the national historical events, I, it's helpful to hear that people are learning from it because I know I'm so inundated and like gay stuff, right? So like for me, the history is like, seems very um, obvious, right? But then there was a, for Lyle, not that long ago, we presented at a, a GSA Gay Straight Alliance, is GSA Con is what it was called. Um, and we were talking about Stonewall and these teens that were in a GSA from Sioux City came up to us and were like, I don't know what Stonewall is, right? So, which to me is like, like the thing, if you know anything about gay history, like that's the thing. And so it was really like, for me, it's like, people don't always know this, especially people from certain parts of the state, certain parts of the country, they're not exposed to these kinds of things. So having that kind of space to like recap it and then put it in a more specific, like Iowa, Iowa City context, I think has taught people a lot. And I have heard from other adults too, that they didn't know about Stonewall or Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson. And then when they read that, they were like, I feel like I learned and I left with a lot and so that's been really helpful to hear and it's you know it I do think it's an important history and even though it's for some of us that study these kinds of things and like DEAI history it may seem sort of a given um, but it isn't something that people understand you know the magnitude of especially the further we get away from like the AIDS epidemic like the mass death that happened in the gay community right like people don't realize I think there's some more correlation with COVID, right? Like they can kind of empathize with that a little more, but I don't think they realize like how much that was targeted at a certain population and that that population was completely ignored, right? Like they're just like, oh, well, they're evil and bad and this is a God punishing you thing, right? So it's helpful to have that kind of context um, for people that don't or aren't coming into the exhibit with it. The other thing I was going to say is that the, the, Hamburg number two cover of um, Better Homes and Dykes is on the cover of the um, the exhibit guide, right? So I went there with some of my some of my my spouse's Ash's colleagues, and they have a three year old, and I did see that three year old coloring in the Better Homes and Dykes cover, which was very very cute and very fun, and she really liked it. So that was the only other thing I had about. Um, we just have a little bit left to tell you, and then we can go into some questions if anyone has questions, but we just wanted to let you know about some things that are 
coming up and things to keep an eye out for. So um, the libraries uh, works with the, the libraries in Johnson County, academic libraries and public libraries in Johnson County to bring in speakers um, a couple times a year. And so we have one next week, local libraries, LIT, which is Listen, Initiate, Talk. And we're bringing in Jamal Jordan and um, what he has fits in really well with our exhibit. And he's a journalist, professor, documentarian, and an author, uh, the author of Queer Love and Color. And it's photographs of um, people of color uh, just expressing their love. And uh, it's, it's a great book. So definitely recommend coming to that conversation. It's virtual and it's free. So you can sign up through our gallery website. Maddie has a couple of guided tours coming up. So there's one on March 28th and April 19th. So if you're really curious to get um, more detail about the exhibit and hear a guided tour uh, through through the ages of queer history of Iowa City with Maddie, you're welcome to come to one of those. So those are each at 4 p.m. Um, uh, we'll, be, we'll be also doing a like more formal presentation for the public virtually on April 5th. Um, look out for information about that. I have not made the webinar yet, but you're welcome to come and to let people know about it. Um, and then later this spring, Anna Holland will be doing a presentation about some of the featured IWA materials, which I think will be really fun. Um, and we're looking into ways to partner with Pride. So we hope that we'll have some Pride related events coming up as well. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Here's a few photos from the opening of the exhibit. And hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about some behind the scenes things. Um, I know we didn't really get a whole ton into content, but we hope you'll have a chance to visit or stop in for a guided tour or feel free to ask us any questions now as well. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.